This episode contains mature content like sex and intimacy. Hey, everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. I'm glad you're here. I'm loving our series right now. We are in a series called For the Love of Sex. (laughs) I mean, we thought we could get real cutesy with the name of it, but I mean... For the love of sex it is. And so we've touched, obviously, on sex before inside other relationship um, series or um, as a a kind of a one-off episode that fit a larger theme. But we really just wanted to, we wanted to give it its own platform to talk a little bit more intimately about, to um, expand on, to have different types of experts weighing in here in a, in a, several different ways. Um, we wanted to kind of unhook the pearls that we have clutched in some previous um, episodes that evolve around sex and just say, uh, we're grown. Let's just talk about, let's talk about bodies. Let's talk about pleasure. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about old sex. Let's talk about new sex. Let's talk about the problems with sex. Let's just, let's just get after it. So I love today's episode because it's from another angle that ultimately matters. And it matters to all of us because of the way we consume entertainment. So um, we're talking about a phenomenon related to sex that's been going through quite a change, a positive one, um, which is great news. If you're, you may have just been paying attention to to noticing some of the differences but on sex scenes when we are in film and TV spaces um, between, let's say, 10 years ago, particularly at the turn of the Me Too movement. Um, and as sexual harassment accusations surfaced about, obviously, Harvey Weinstein and led to which led to like hundreds of other accusations all over Hollywood. And those are just reported, right? And so if you've noticed sex portrayed in film and on television um, post Me Too really um, sheds a light maybe on how it used to be portrayed. Like, you know, if you ever go back to something 20 years ago or more, a show and you go, whoa, whoa, I cannot believe they showed that or said that um, or did that, um, how women potentially were exploited um, and 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 why a lot of folks in the industry felt like there were no boundaries in these areas in terms of filming sex scenes and that the rumored casting couch was like a sad reality. And so, so many brave women have come forward and talked about their experiences inside the entertainment industry, um, some of whom had been previously blackballed right from the business or struggled to continue their careers um, after having called their abusers on the carpet and then suffered at the hands of an unfair power differential. Um, So now if sex is going to be a part of a film or television show, there are rules and there are boundaries. It's a great positive shift on set now. There are generally professionals who plan sex scenes and they determine the consent of the um, actors in advance. They provide them with the equipment if necessary to ensure that their dignity is respected. And there are guardrails now around a portion of the entertainment industry that has been historically marked by coercion, a lack of consent, uh, well, we're going to talk about, I don't want to steal the thunder. We'll talk about it. So I wanted to touch on Hollywood and um, because I think Hollywood in so many ways, pop culture in general, sets the tone for the rest of us to culturally talk about sex. And it does influence our level of comfort with it. Um, it forces us to confront how scenes like that make us feel uh, when we watch stories just pick a thing of maybe unconsensual sex or sex in a long-term partnership or teenagers fumbling around for the first time on screen. It affects us. Our own memories are triggered. Our own feelings are triggered. Um, It does matter. And so I, I 
we'll just be honest, like what happened five years ago when Alyssa Milano tweeted her story out on the heels of Tarana Burke's hashtag, you know, me too. It, it created a flashpoint that changed how we define and disseminate power on screen and off screen. And, um, and so I, I am, this conversation was really, really interesting because today we are delving into this a bit inside the industry. And we're going to talk about the changes um, that have been brought to bear. And I am so excited to have one of those professionals who's an incredibly well-pedigreed intimacy coordinator to walk us through it. So today we're talking with Jessica Steinrock. Jessica got her PhD in theater at the University of Illinois. And she has gone on to manage the safety of actors during intimate scenes on sets of major outlets, Netflix, Hulu, TNT, all, I mean, all of it. She is a certified intimacy coordinator and one of only 40 intimacy coordinators listed on SAG AFTRA's registry of qualified intimacy coordinators. Um, so it's a growing, it's a growing industry that she is a part of, which is exciting. Additionally, She's the CEO of her own company that certifies intimacy coordinators and is SAG after certified as a company. So um, she knows the ins and outs of community, communicating consent, um, managing a set, and the importance of changing the standards of the industry. It's fascinating. It's interesting. Um, it's new. It's kind of pioneering work. And it has far reaching effects. This is good news, guys. This is great news. And you're going to love her. She is so lively. She's so dynamic. She's just, her energy is infectious. I loved actually this entire conversation. So please let me introduce you to the wonderful Jessica Steinrock. Jessica, I am Really, just so excited to meet you. Thank you so much for being on the For the Love podcast. I, I'm like seriously looking forward to this conversation. <laughs> oh, good. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me and talking about this work. I think it's really important. It is. And it's fascinating and it's kind of new mm -hmm. and it's needed and necessary. I mean, I just have a million questions. <laughs> so kind of before we drill into your work, Mm -hmm. Can you just tell my listeners who are new to you like this? Hi, I'm Jessica. This is my deal. This is where I live. These are my people. Yeah. This is kind of how I got up to this moment in my life and just kind of a snapshot of who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, my name is Dr. Jessica Steinrock. I am an intimacy director for live performance and, and an intimacy coordinator for TV and film. Uh, and I also am the CEO of a company called Intimacy Directors and Coordinators that trains and educates people about this role. And we're uh, looking to perpetuate this role throughout the entertainment industry. So that's just a little bit of like a my, my bio. Um, I'll say I personally, so this is a really new career. A lot of folks yeah. are like, oh, I've never heard of it. And that makes a lot of sense because it's a brand new career. Um, a lot of people have been working in other ways and shapes and forms advocating for this work, but we're really starting to see this job and this job title crystallize in the last five years, which is really yeah. exciting. Um, and so I got here kind of a roundabout way because my yeah. background is actually in improv and stand-up comedy performance okay. and mm -hmm. Uh, I did a lot of my research looking at how we navigate consent in spontaneous theater. So if we're mm. going to do an improv show, ask, you know, ask for a suggestion from the audience. How do mm. we then take that suggestion, perform it on stage with no script, no rehearsal, and yeah. still navigate consent between the actors? Wow. So those were my original research questions. And through that research journey and through some friends, my husband is a fight director for theater. So he does a mm. lot of like sword fighting and fake yeah. punches and things. So I met some friends in his community who were doing some incredible work about staging sex on uh, TV and mm. on stage. And I met two incredible professionals named uh, Tony Asina and Alicia Rodas, who have been huge leaders in this industry. And I had the opportunity to collaborate and build with them. And that has ultimately led me to where I am today. It's really amazing. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought about navigating these guardrails in a live improv setting. I mean, that yeah. is tricky. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, Sue, it is. I mean, you learned like in the deep end. 
Um, Uh Because then, of course, you can drag it into film and TV where everything can be scripted and carefully shot and edited. But yeah, that's a live wire performance right there. Um, And it's an industry that's not really known for being the most friendly towards women or towards, Mm. you know, anybody who's been historically marginalized. And so you have a lot of power dynamics to consider. Yeah, they're really, uh, really interesting questions. And I I will also say that those communities are doing incredible work uh, navigating consent and working on eliminating harassment. So uh, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, it's been really exciting to be. I uh, loved, I just love to hear this. I feel like when any industry begins to take this seriously, when they begin Mm -hmm. to um, protect um, consent and dignity, it it has a, an effect everywhere. It just yes. justice somewhere ultimately means justice in more places and everywhere, yes. hopefully. And so, I this is a big deal even outside of the industry. And so, inside your world here, mm-hmm. and I think a, a lot of us just know this simply as uh, consumers of <laughs> of TV and film or yeah. and theater, of course. Um, but can you just put it like kind of on paper? Um, in terms of what the sets were like in filming spicy scenes historically, um, particularly before like the Me Too movement, definitely before the advent of intimacy coordinators um, as sort of a, a of a boundary maker and keeper. So what 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 were the guardrails back in the day? Yeah, you know, there were not as many as there are now, that's for sure. Um, And I think it's really interesting because you see such a range of experiences. Some Mm -hmm. people had great experiences filming intimate scenes. You know, I never want to be like, you know, everybody had a terrible time. Um, And there were so many people who have been part of the work that intimacy coordinators are doing now before the role even existed. Like costumers are a really great example of folks who prior to this this role of the intimacy coordinator really becoming part of our professional vocabulary. They were doing things with the modesty garments. They were supporting the Mm. actors. They were emotional advocates in many ways. The challenge was though, is that even if someone was doing that support, that wasn't part of their job description. They didn't necessarily have institutional power to support them in that advocacy. Mm. It was all a little bit more underground. Um, So we also hear a lot of stories where actors are advocating for their scene partners or directors are advocating, right? But none of that advocacy was guaranteed. Sure. And we didn't know where it was going to come from or where you could go if you had questions, which means in an unfortunate instance where someone maybe was abusing their power or where communication was unclear or where someone did feel coerced, there wasn't necessarily a clear pathway towards support. Mm. Um, and so that has meant that over time, and because the power dynamics in the, uh, in the entertainment industry are so strong, we had a lot of issues and challenges that led to coercion, led to lack of consent, led to abuse of power. Um, And a number of folks have really come out talking about not great experiences, performing intimate scenes or being asked to do scenes of intimacy, really leading to the need for a role who's going to help coordinate, communicate and support everyone on the on set to do these scenes safely and with artistry. So if you were to put like a fine point on it, um, when there weren't standards, I mean, you could hope for the best and maybe you got a great director or a great yeah. scene partner, mm-hmm. uh, maybe the producers savvy, but obviously as mentioned, absolutely no guarantees, no yeah. industry standards here. For those of us who are kind of outside of the world, we may be thinking, well, I mean, if a sex scene is written, where, how, how can this be coercion? Like if you agree to it, if you've like, well, I've read it and I'm going to be a part of this, like, what does it really look like, um, for intimacy to be breached, um, to be exploited in some way? Um, what did the power differential, how do the power differentials like literally play in, um, to ultimately a super potentially toxic work Mm -hmm. environment, yeah, I mean, you know, we read a script, right? And it says they have sex. And you're like, all right, I, I think I know what that means. Mm. But there's at least my brain already is like, there's 50 ways that that scene could look. And I might only really be comfortable filming 20 of them. Mm. Think about all the different positions there are when two mm. humans decide to be intimate with one another. And all of those, what sex quote unquote means is going to look different to each and every person. Mm-hmm. So we can even take nudity uh, as an example. So I might okay. say, 
Uh, you know, are you comfortable with uh, exposing your chest or your breast, right? And you might be like, oh yeah, that, sure, that sounds fine. But then when we're on the day, you realize that it's actually, there's 50 other people in the scene. It's fluorescent yeah. lighting. It's going to be a yeah. close-up on your chest, right? All of that information mm. will affect whether or not someone can give consent. And coercion comes into play when we lack time for consideration, mm. which I don't know if uh, if you've heard the phrase, but like, right, time is money. And on set, that is magnified. One of the very first things that I was told the first set I walked onto was don't be the thing that slows it down. There is a huge mm. pressure on the day, on set, yeah. to get through all of the shot lists that you're trying to get through. Mm. And so you don't want to be the thing that slows it down. Sure. And actors hear this over and over and over again. And so if... On that day, if someone's like, great, are you ready to take off your shirt? And there's all this new information coming yeah. at you. There's no time for consideration. And so mm -hmm. maybe you say yes, maybe you keep pushing forward. And then you walk off set 24 hours later, you pause and think, hmm, mm -hmm. that didn't feel great. Yeah. I think if I'd had that information, I wouldn't have said yes. Mm -hmm. I felt pressured into saying yes. Um, or pressured to say like, oh, well, this is a really great director. This is such an opportunity. Um, yeah. There's a million people out the door behind me that'll do this role if I won't. Right? All of those things that we kind of hear as industry cliches add to this element where pressure and time can lead the, to coercion. Okay. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. So this convo with intimacy coordinator Jessica... It's fascinating to me, right? With a peek behind all those like film and TV sex scenes. You know what's also sexy, you guys? Good sheets. If you ask me how I like my sheets, my answer is that I like them soft, melty, butter. And you guys, that is exactly what Bull & Branch serves up. Bull & Branch uses the highest quality threads on earth. Their sheets are made from slow-grown organic cotton, for just a superior softness and a better night's sleep, of course. Not only do they feel buttery to the touch, they're super breathable. So they're perfect for like both cooler and warmer months. I also love that their sheets come in colors besides white that you actually want to have. Like they have a whole range in all sizes from twin up to California King. And their sheets are made without any nonsense, like no toxins, which means they're free from pesticides, formaldehyde, uh, whatever harsh chemicals. Boil and Branch also gives you a 30-night risk-free guarantee with free shipping and returns on all U.S. orders. So this is basically a no-brainer. Make the most of bedtime with Bowl and Branch sheets. Get 15% off your first set of sheets when you use promo code for the love at bowlandbranch.com. So that's Bowl and Branch, B-O-L-L-A-N-D branch.com. Promo code for the love. Can you give us an example or two of how having you or another intimacy coordinator you, that you've trained on set and um, kind of almost in real time, either changed a director's perspective or changed the, the safety or self-advocacy for, for an actor, um, mm -hmm. like an aha moment, if you will, inside your industry <laughs> where you went, this is why we're here. This is, yeah. this is how this work actually mattered on this exact set at this time. Um, one of the things that I think is so powerful and I've seen be really powerful about my job is that we do so much prep work. Most of my job, mm. I would say like 60, 70% of my job really comes a week before we're filming the scene. And okay. that's where we get kind of that balance of consideration and time. Um, and actually SAG-AFTRA, which is the actors union for screen actors, um, has released new guidelines, uh, created more safety net measures. One of which is that an actor has to have their simulated sex and nudity rider, which is like a contract that mm -hmm. specifically talks about those scenes. They have to have that now for 48 hours before filming. And that's a mm. great and huge change. Again, thinking about how time and consideration leads to less coercion. That's a huge, huge mm. thing. Because it used to be like on the spot. Uh, day of. I mean, sometimes there was a little bit flexibility, mm -hmm. but yeah, you could have it like on the day, get it in your trailer, read Got it, it, sign it, do it that day. Yeah. Um, and so now what this also means, though, is we have to have a lot more conversations ahead of time. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Things like talking to the actor, talking to the director, facilitating a conversation between the actors and the director, where the director's like, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I want, and the actors are thinking like, oh, well, I think my character would do this, or what positions are we going to see? How Mm -hmm. much of my body is going to be exposed? And then I get an opportunity to talk with the actors individually, one-on-one, to give them space to express their concerns Mm -hmm. with someone who doesn't have hiring, firing power over them. That's good. Yeah. Right. And so I get to say, oh, great, you're, you're concerned about that. You're nervous about that. Can I support you in communicating that to the director? Can I support you in communicating that to the wardrobe person? Do you want to try on those garments before the day? Do you want to have an opportunity to practice making sure that those movements are going to keep that garment on your body in a way that makes you feel confident and comfortable? Mm -hmm. Um, And so then on the day, my goal is, is that there should be no surprises and everybody is fully aware, fully considered and fully confident in what they're going to need to do their best work. That's fantastic. Recently, an actor for Game of Thrones went on record to say that intimacy coordinators were unnecessary and could even um, interfere Mm -hmm. and prevent actors from creating natural looking sex scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, And I can imagine other people maybe have a similar critique. So obviously you want your work to protect and support actors um, while also giving the best possible outcome in terms of acting, right? So how do you respond to something like that? Yeah, well, first and foremost, uh, any kind of change in an industry is always going to be met with questions, concerns, and even fear. Uh, So usually the resistance, if I've ever experienced any, comes from a place of just not quite understanding how this works um, and that it's just something that's new. Now, with this specifically, this specific uh, idea of spontaneity and organic nature and acting, um, one of the things I like to parallel a lot is how we work in stunt scenes. Um, And so, right, we're not actually punching each other. We're not actually stabbing each other with swords. Uh, That is all deeply meticulously choreographed. That is something that we've rehearsed and practiced and also looks incredibly spontaneous. Good example. Uh, Right, and looks amazing Mm -hmm. because the actors are safe, confident, and are great actors. Like, they're just good actors, Mm -hmm. right? And no one would be like, oh, well, the bar fight's not going to look real unless we just improvise it, right? That's true. That is so true. Yes. (laughs) And so when it comes to scenes of intimacy, there's just kind of this like cultural idea. Well, no, we just have to go for it. We just have to. And I I don't think Mm. that we actually need to. And I've seen over and over again that actually when actors have a sense of what's going to happen to their bodies, they know the arc of the scene. They have time to think about how their character would want or move in those positions. Mm -hmm. They then layer on their acting onto this movement scaffold. And we create a better story because when actors are safe, they do their best work. Makes when actors sense. are worried about their safety, half of their brain is going to be thinking about what's going on to my body. Where's their hand going to go next? Where am I going to get kissed? Do I want to get kissed? Do I trust yeah. this person? If we eliminate all of that talk, the actor can just focus on their job and create so brilliant good. storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. And what you're not saying is let's take out all the like really s- anything that feels too sexual. It, they can still be yeah. super sexual. Oh, yeah. Like the scenes can still be spicy and yeah. hot and touchy and all the things. All you're the not things. Remo- you're not removing the no, sexuality from a do- sex scene. That's yes. right. <laughs> that's I right. love I love steamy scenes. I love spicy scenes. I am yeah. a romantic connoisseur in my media. I love it all. And I think what makes me love it though, is knowing that these actors are safe while doing that. These actors are excited to tell those stories that they weren't coerced into doing it because they think it's going to give them their break or their next job. Mm. Cause I want to believe that the actors want to tell that story. And that makes me really excited as a viewer. Absolutely. As an intimacy coordinator, You work with actors from all sorts of backgrounds, different ethnicities, different genders, different races. So you've got kind of a wide array, obviously, um, of actors to work with. How do you see your particular role, this new role that we are delighted to see inside the entertainment industry, addressing any additional complications around just this wide array of of identity, um, potential issues on a scene, on any given set. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and when it comes to consent and coercion, those things are magnified when we look at how intersectional identities interplay. Intersectional meaning someone who maybe has uh, two or more historically marginalized characteristics. Sure. Um, so that's you know race, sexuality, gender, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, as a, a white intimacy coordinator, I can speak from my experience uh, as a white woman um, and support other women in those ways. But what we also need to see is a pool of diverse and qualified intimacy coordinators. Right yes. now, the mm. like right now intimacy coordinators are predominantly white women. Um, okay. And while this is a, a relatively um, new field and a rare field where women are the majority, what we need to see is a more diverse mm. pool of intimacy coordinators so that we have more of those voices impacting and supporting women of color, uh, black trans women, um, actors who have historically marginalized characteristics. Um, So part of that, uh, as I mentioned, I run a company that trains intimacy coordinators. Mm -hmm. And so we have a number of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives because we need to see more intimacy coordinators from more diverse backgrounds uh, and support those individuals into this discipline to give actors their best support. Excellent. Um, let's let's come up high. Let's let's pull up twenty thousand feet and kind of look down mm-hmm. um, at just some basic standards. We talk. You talk a lot about consent. Consent mm-hmm. being one of the center spokes of the wheel here. And <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. obviously, foundational to intimacy. Um, really, whether you're on a set or in a personal relationship, like this, this is an across the board mm-hmm. standard just for humans. So. Just in your words and your experience, can you break down for everybody listening? Um, what is consent? What does it look like? Um, what does it not look like? Um, and how? What are some of the? What's the path um, to a healthy consensual sexual space? Yeah, consent is such an important topic, um, and and consent is the agreement between two parties. That's an informed agreement to engage in an action or to talk about a topic, right? Or to do something together. That's that's pretty broad. Um, but when we break it down, uh, essentially, it's that yes and no are both equally valid options. Um, so something I say a lot is that yes means nothing unless no is an option. That's good. So one more time. Yeah. Yes means yes. nothing unless no is an option. That's great. And so when we think about an industry whose power dynamics have made it feel like if you say no, you're not going to get the job. You're not going to uh, get your big break. There's again, I used that example earlier, but there's a hundred other people at the door that'll do it if you won't. Mm-hmm. That means that yes isn't actually like doesn't mean anything because there's so much pressure behind it. Mm-hmm. And so what we do is we create space for consideration. We offer information. We allow someone to try something out and then to change their mind, knowing that they'll have support if they do change their mind. Um, and we we build in all these different pathways to allow communication to flow so that consent actually has a possibility of happening. Now, mm-hmm. we're in an entertainment industry where this is an employer contract. Um, and so there's always going to be a power dynamic at play, but our job is to mitigate it as much as possible and to create as much space for information to be passed from person to person um, and allow for that free flowing of information to happen. Mm-hmm. Now, in personal lives, uh, there shouldn't be that kind of power dynamic, right? So that's where we really get into the differences between consent in a professional setting, mm-hmm. particularly when we're simulating sex for TV versus consent with two partners who want to engage in an intimate activity. But yeah. we also see that's why, you know, the don't sleep with your boss. Don't your boss don't totally. sleep with your employee, of course. right? Like that's power dynamic uh, 101 where we're just not going to have an option for consent to happen when there's that big of a power dynamic at play. All right, listen up. I have a brand new me course on sex that's about to come out and it is fire. Look, I don't care if you're single, married, mingling, whatever. You do you, but this course is for you. Because who among us does not want to improve our sex life, right? The answer is no one. So for this course, our sexpert, if you will, Dr. Celeste Holbrook is here and you are going to absolutely fangirl her so hard. She's a sexologist. That's a real thing. And she has so much real life wisdom and practical tips and takeaways and more. So in this particular course, we talk about real steps you can take to improving sex for you. We delve into discovery 
Um, Celeste calls it your erotic sandbox. You'll see. I've said too much. Um, We've got some ideas for things you might want to try. We also talk about the sexual narratives we may have been given or not given and how they might still be affecting us. Like maybe the lack of sex ed or lots of shame or purity culture. We're going to unravel some of that and get to the core of how it might even be impacting us still today. We also talk about understanding ways to create long-term satisfying sexual experiences and you guys so much more. I really cannot wait to put this one in your hot little hands. The sex course comes out in March, but go ahead and sign up now at mecourse.org for the best pre-sale price at 40% off. That's mecourse.org for the best early bird pricing. Mm. So kind of staying on that path, the, the through line here, um, this is obviously a series about sex. And so, um, I wanted, I was excited to talk to you and about just sort of the standards around sex in, in Hollywood and pop culture, because entertainment absolutely sets the tone for Mm -hmm. the rest of us. To how are we talking about sex culturally? Um, it, it it touches on our own memories, our own experiences, obviously. Um, our own feelings are activated. Um, mm-hmm. Some of um, some of some sometimes the entertainment industry normalizes language and ideas and standards for us. I mean, like it or not, like that's just kind of how it works. It really does have a cultural effect Absolutely. on the rest of us, and so. Obviously, we've heard from you um, as to the importance and integrity of creating um, a healthy working environment for actors to be in, obviously, in intimate scenes. Um, and I, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear that those standards are improving and that you're a part of it and mm-hmm. that there is a whole group of you looking at this going, we can do better. And it will not, not only will it not harm the industry, it will improve the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I wonder if it, obviously you're funneled down like into your niche here, but yes. do you think about, does it, does it um, occur to you that what you are doing is actually good for the rest of us too, that oh, you constantly. are creating sexual health um, in a way that has this exponential effect on the rest of us consumers of entertainment um, and what it's doing for us both personally sometimes um, and then for society as a whole. It just, is that a, is that at all a piece of your vision? Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and it's, it's a multifaceted and a multi-pronged approach um, because I believe you know, like, let's let's just zoom in on an actor's experience. If you're being treated with respect, autonomy, consent during this kind of intimate scene, then when you move on to a different kind of scene, if you aren't being treated with that same amount of respect and yeah. autonomy, that's going to flash or signal. And so what we're also seeing now is consent culture expanding on TV and film sets. We're mm-hmm. seeing as we talk about the intimate scene coming up, more perspectives and voices are now going into yes. that storytelling. It's less of a top-down approach. Directors, I've worked with some incredible directors recently who have been so excited to hear the perspective of those actors on how they think their character would move. What's the story we all want to tell? And we're yeah. getting consent on the story we're telling, not just the physical actions. We're getting consent about how are we using our bodies to tell a story of intimacy? And is that a story we want to tell? Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, I do when I'm looking at a project, whether or not I want to be part of it or not, is how am I using my craft? And is that the story I want to put out in the world? Is that the story I want to tell? Now, I do think it's really important that we pair this with also media literacy, more sex education, so that um, young adults aren't turning to TV intimacy and thinking, oh, that's how it works, right? TV intimacy, we've got like three minutes max to tell a story. (laughs) So we're not going to get... Uh, we're never going to have an accurate representation. We might have an accurate representation of consent, of initial foreplay, of a climactic moment, but that's only going to be a fragment of what an entire sexual encounter looks like. So I think media literacy and better sex education for youth is really important to allow Mm -hmm. art to remain art and art Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be the teacher. 
I don't think that art should be the teacher. I think Mm. it can be an opportunity for expression, for exploration. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so we have to pair that with better sex education in our industry or in our uh, world as a whole. That's so good. I mean, if, if we expect art to be prescriptive Mm -hmm. and always instructive, yeah. Um, then that's going to box in creativity in a yeah. very, very narrow way. Because of course, some of your work involves, I'm, I'm assuming involves s- sexual scenes that are violent, right. Yes. Or um, aggressive, or it's not a lovely, war- precious part of the, of the storyline. So, right. Like you, you can't only be relegated to right. instructive um, sexual like outcomes in your work. I am sure you've got to work within a lot of scenes. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, we can also look again at uh, the violence example where it's like, no one's looking at that for problem, proper martial technique. No one's like, Oh, that's, that's the right way to, you know, to point. push someone at a bar. Right. No, we know that that's art. We know yeah. that that's telling a story. We know that you shouldn't punch your friend if they say something bad. Right. Like we know these things because we have broader education and cultural context Good. to view that. We don't mm-hmm. have that with intimacy right now. And that yeah. means there's additional pressure on scenes of intimacy mm. to be the instructor when I think that that's always going to land us in a place that's not going to be healthy or helpful. TV is a fantasy. TV is a storytelling. TV Definitely. is a uh, is an opportunity to send a message or share a message. Um, and people are always going to have different opinions on um, how that message got sent. You are so right. But what your particular work does, your your corner of of the industry does, is it is instructive toward corporate culture. Yeah. It is instructive toward college campuses. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for other industries to be able to look in at what you are doing, where mm-hmm. you are prioritizing safety, consent, mm-hmm. um, autonomy agency. Mm -hmm. These are huge, important sexual themes that I would love to see duplicated in 10 dozen other spaces, Mm -hmm. right? Where, where women largely, but also men are still vulnerable. They are Mm -hmm. still exploited. There are not enough standards wrapped around practices. There are power differentials. And so, so while the sex scenes themselves should not be our, our, our bar, your work is, I love what you're doing. And so to that end, as we kind of wrap it up here, you've mentioned, and I mentioned in the top of the hour that you are the CEO of your own company, you certify intimacy coordinator. So I've got kind of two questions about that. First of all, amazing, just amazing. (laughs) Second of all, what does that mean? What does that look like? Like, how does an intimacy coordinator get certified? Like, what is it? And then, and then I would love to hear broadly what what your vision is for the future of creating safe sets and and the profession of intimacy coordinators, which I hope just grows and grows and grows and grows. Same, same. Mm-hmm. Um, so great. Part one of your question: How does one get certified as an intimacy coordinator? Um, our certificate. Our certification is essentially certifying that you've made it through our program um, and that you have demonstrated the qualifications needed for this role. So we base our qualifications off of the SAG-AFTRA recommended qualifications. SAG-AFTRA has a ton of great resources. So if anyone out there is interested in becoming an intimacy coordinator, I definitely recommend checking those out. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we offer a foundation in consent, context, choreography, um, mental health support. And then we so we've got some two. Two, two initial courses, level one and level two, aptly named. And then we have a, a larger level three certification course. That's a multi-month program that includes mm. both online and in-person education, where we go over the specific choreographic techniques, how this work functions. And then we support folks through a mentorship period um, when they go on to sets to ensure that they have community mm-hmm. and they're still supported, that they have someone to text frantically. If they're like, oh no, I don't know how to handle this thing that's just happened. Yes to make sure that they have support when they're on set doing this work. So our company has a program and we, uh, I think we're actually opening up an application cycle uh, in the next couple of weeks. So that's, Mm -hmm. that's exciting. Um, But so we, we take applications from folks who completed our level one and level two program. And then, uh, and then we we select a small cohort and train them up. Yeah, that's fantastic. So then you are the portal for whom directors, producers come to, and you are able to sort of deploy your certified instructors all over the place, right? Sets everywhere. 
Sort of. So we don't actually act as an agency, but we do have a list of our of people who have gone through our program and who are certified with us on our website. So we do hope that producers come to that website, find someone in their area, reach out to them uh, to help navigate that portion of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, frankly, your work pr- protects mm-hmm. directors and producers. It, yes, does. it does. So <laughs> they ha- they would have just personal incentive, I would think, to have you on set um, to keep everybody above the fray. Mm -hmm. And, and also just create an environment where actors want to continue to work for them. So, I mean, it's kind of a win-win for everybody, not just the actors, but those who are interested in building healthy sets. And what about your, your vision for the future? What would you love to see? Do you have, are there still some, uh, some holes in the Mm -hmm. metric that you think we still need to work on this, or this is what I'd like to see in the future? Yeah, absolutely. And I think kind of what we were talking about actually dovetails nicely. The other thing my company does uh, is we do workshops and education for the larger entertainment community as a whole or other other organizations even uh, that are interested in incorporating more of these consent-based practices, um, whether they're in entertainment or not. Um, and our mission and vision inside our company is to create a culture of consent in which intimate stories can be told with safety and artistry. So really thinking about this from like, you know, the 30,000 foot view, we know that we have to have a culture where folks are familiar with the vocabulary of consent, where the person, uh, where the boom operator is asking for consent from this, uh, from another sound Mm. person, where that consent is a culture on, where consent is part of the entire entertainment industry. So that when we get to a scene of intimacy, we're not starting from, okay, do you know you can say both yes and no? We're starting from a place where everybody already feels autonomy and agency, excitement, participation, and we can just just jump straight into that artistry component. So Mm -hmm. my hope is, you know, 10, 15 years from now, I'm not giving as many lectures on here's how we define consent. Here's what this looks like. You have agency, you have autonomy. I'm hoping 10, 15 years from now, I'm jumping in and we're saying, what positions do we want? How do we want to tell this story? And we're starting right. there because that foundation is already in place. I love it. Um, those those industry changes and standards only feel impossible until they aren't, mm-hmm. right? Like, and they're, they're already it, changing. It's that's amazing. Right. The difference that's right. now and 10 years ago, it's huge. It's tremendous. And there have been so it many is. people that have been a part of that. It's tremendous and it's worth the work. It's worth the clunky early steps when people are like, what even is your job? <laughs> right. um, or, you know, there's, there's critique from the wings. You're going to yeah. mess up acting. Yeah. Just, somebody has to pioneer. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to see you doing that. And well, I have an um, incredible community of colleagues who have gone before me and are coming with me to, to really make this change happen. Good for you. Good for you, Jessica. Okay, last question. Okay. I ask everybody this, every guest in every series. And so, as I always say, I want you to feel absolutely free to answer this however you want. It can be Mm -hmm. like earnest and sincere, or it can be ridiculous. It's, Mm -hmm. we've gotten every kind of answer and we love them all. So I borrowed (laughs) this question from another author, but the question is, what is saving your life right now? What is saving my life right now? Therapy. I love therapy. Oh Mm -hmm. my goodness. I I do all the kinds of therapy. My partner and I started going to couples therapy and it has been the best thing that has ever happened to our relationship. And I feel Mm -hmm. like there's a huge stigma that's like, oh, if you go to couples therapy, that's because your relationship is in shambles. And we were like, no, we just went because we both loved individual therapy. And we were like, let's do this together. And it has changed the way we communicate. It has changed the way we know how to love one another. It has given us a brand new vocabulary. I have never been happier than with the tools. I mean, between the two of us, we've got three therapists. It's incredible. Um, And I love every one of them. And I'm so grateful Mm. for the folks who are there giving their time, energy, and professional experience to make my life better. Um, Mm. And I think everybody should go to more therapy. (laughs) Same. I am so deeply on record as saying therapy has, well, I can't really imagine my adult life without it. And it's so, am- yeah. Amazing. Especially if you find the right fit. Cause I recognize, yeah. you know, you, you might have to try if a couple of therapists to sure. find someone, but when it clicks, it clicks That's and right. it's truly improved the quality of my life. Just beyond, beyond a doubt. Okay. Love that answer. 
signing off here. Can you just tell anybody listening who has any level of interest in you and your work and your company and anything where they want to know more, where can they follow you? Where can they find you? All that stuff. Uh, you can check out my company on idcprofessionals.com. You can also follow me on TikTok at Intimacy Coordinator. Uh, there is a, a link tree where you'll be able to find me on Instagram and things like yeah. that. Um, but I, we would love to see more folks signing up for some of these classes to get that culture of consent in place, whether you're in the entertainment industry or not. I think there's a lot of value for everybody, but otherwise mm. um, I just enjoy the conversation and hope that people find me and continue to talk about spicy scenes with me. Me too. Thank you so <laughs> much, Jessica, for being on the show today, for sharing such important stuff with the rest of us, for giving us a little bit of hope. Like, look, everything's not on fire. Some yeah. things are going right. Absolutely. Some things are going well. Some things are actually improving. It's night. It's good news. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I'm cheering you on. Absolutely cheering you on. Thank you for all your incredible work. Thank you so much for having me and for sharing about this work. I, I'm very grateful to be on this show. All right, you guys. When any niche industry improves their standards around sex, consent, safety, agency, it's literally good for all of us. This does have a, a ripple effect on other industries. Wouldn't you love to see the Jessicas of the world in all the places I mentioned where safety is not guaranteed or it's not standardized? Um, I just, this is great work. I, I feel really hopeful that there's no industry, there's no environment, um, there's no institution beyond repair, beyond overhaul or reform. And so I loved talking to Jessica. Um, as mentioned, I'll have all her stuff rounded up. Go over to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, and I'll have the link to this episode. I'll have all the show notes, and I will have um, easy links to everything Jessica does, her socials, her TikTok, her company, anything where, because I don't know if you caught that there at the very end, but as, as they certify and train intimacy coordinators, it's not just necessarily inside entertainment. So this may have a direct impact on your business or on your particular corporate environment or your educational space, whatever it is. I'm just saying this has a lot of tentacles and it may be useful for you to check out as you, if you are interested in creating more safety and agency around any sexual issues in your environment. So Stay tuned for more. More coming in next week, you guys. I'll see you then.